Our New Testament lesson this morning, reading this morning, is from Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 through uh, 28. And this is on page 222 of the New Testament. Furthermore, the former, former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priestly priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. This he did once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for being our reader this morning. Tom Henderson, thank you. Uh, I've been preaching from Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, which is really a sermon throughout this month. Uh, this is the last uh, sermon on Hebrews that I will do. I'll be going back into the Gospel of Mark next Sunday, but it's an important book. And today I'm going to conclude a little bit of a wrap-up of what Hebrews means. And in, I've had to do a lot of really you know, work. I feel like I'm back in seminary again as I've been preparing these sermons because Hebrews is very rich, but it's also hard to interpret to some degree. So I hope that I have helped you do that, and if I haven't, uh, as I said, these sermons are kind of cumulative. You could go back and look at some of the things I've said, or if I've left any questions, please feel free to email or call. Uh, But Hebrews is just a, a wonderful book, and I hope that in this final sermon on Hebrews today that it will maybe bring to conclusion and clarify the understanding of what the preacher, who probably was Paul, was trying to say to us. So thank you for your patience. I received an email from one of the subscription genealogy websites with the exciting news, according to them, that they had discovered some new information about my ancestry. Now, I didn't realize I had any old information about my ancestry, but ever since my wife Amy subscribed to Ancestry.com, which is one of the many genealogical websites, I occasionally have received these emails. Now, I shouldn't be surprised that Ancestry.com is discovering new information about my progenitors since their business model demands a way to keep subscribers from letting their subscriptions lapse. It's called recurring revenue. And what better way than to discover new information about our long dead relatives? to keep us interested and keep us subscribing. There are times, however, when new information about our family histories is more important than a business model or even a fun hobby. Those who were adopted often seek knowledge about their heritage since genetics are so critical to modern health care. Another way is one I have mentioned from the pulpit involving the use of what's called family systems theory, which I use as a counseling tool. And it's especially helpful for 
premarital counseling. You may recall me saying a while back, or I've said in the sometime during the years I've been here, that when I was first learning how to do premarital counseling, we were trained to match personalities. And we used personality tests to see how the temperaments of the two individuals would either match or contrast. But with family systems theory, the idea that individuals marry individuals was supplanted by the idea that families marry families. This meant that before two people were married, it was important not just to know who they were, but where each one of them came from. That was the change. I cannot begin to tell you how often I have performed a wedding and met all the relatives whose lives and personalities, both good and bad, were described to me by the couple because that's part of the process. Of course, those relatives don't know that I know everything about them. They only know me as a stranger, but I know them in a different way. And that knowledge, to be honest with you, gives me an insight that sometimes colors my judgment, no matter how they present themselves in the moment. As we have been looking at the book of Hebrews this past month, it is apparent that the preacher wants us to look at ourselves in a different way that is over and above any moment in our lives, be it a past moment, a present moment, or thinking about the future. This was essential for the preacher. Because the churches in that time, as I have mentioned these past few weeks, was under great, great, they were under great persecution, creating moments for these Christians that were antithetical to the perceived promises of Christianity. The understanding in the initial decades of Christianity was that Jesus, the Messiah, would be returning at any moment to gather the people of God into his eternal kingdom. The desire for this to happen quickly, to happen immediately, obviously grew in intensity as believers were harassed, arrested, exiled from their families and their communities, and even sometimes martyr. Not only were Christians questioning why Jesus had yet to return as he had promised, but their faith was beginning to collapse under the pressure of their difficult lives. A moment ago, I noted that in family systems theory, it is not just important to know who we are, but where we come from. The preacher in Hebrews uses the same approach as he seeks to undergird the faith of his persecuted brethren. But he does not need to examine that the family histories of believers in order to accomplish this. Rather, he points disciples to the past, present, and future of their one true spiritual ancestor, who not only established their past, but shapes their present and has already determined their future. Now, to understand the preacher's message for both believers in his day and our day, we need to recall the status of these Christians before they were baptized. 
You can't understand Hebrews without understanding that. Worship in their earlier lives, whether Jewish or Roman or pagan, was centered on the temple or a temple. And the temple was centered, as we know, upon acts of sacrifice by ordained priests or priestesses. Why? In order to access forgiveness from God or the gods and alleviate human suffering. When Israel's temple, Israel's temple, was destroyed around 70 AD, as we might imagine, this created a massive crisis of worship for the Jews who could no longer engage in the elaborate rituals of their sacrificial religion. Now, while such was not the case for the Gentiles in the Roman world, those Gentiles who became disciples of Jesus, who joined the church, surrendered their temple worship for the simple gatherings of Christianity, which replaced ritual sacrifice with the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. In his message to a church in which all of the members, Jewish and Gentile, had a memory of temple worship, the preacher of Hebrews wants to establish and wants to celebrate their new sacrificial heritage in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, who, as God's Messiah, became once and for all their one true and only high priest. In other words, Jesus is now their temple. Their temple is now Jesus. And according to the writer of Hebrews, they need no other. To make the point, the preacher reminds them of the failings inherent in the high priest of their previous religions. These high priests, though they were able to make sacrificial offerings, could in no way guarantee their effectiveness in satisfying God through the forgiveness of sin. That's why the preacher writes these words. Furthermore, the former high priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But Jesus holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. In holding up Jesus as our one true high priest, Hebrews grants the readers an assurance based upon three effects, three effects of the Messiah's sacrifice upon the cross. First, the effectiveness of Jesus' death upon the cross was affirmed not only in his resurrection, but the fact that God had already seated Jesus at God's right hand. Jesus affirmed this new reality for his followers in the Gospel of Matthew when just before his ascension he announced all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now you'll notice Jesus does not say one word there about the end of the world. During his whole ministry, he was constantly being asked, when is the world going to end? When, when is God going to come? When are the promises of the prophets going to happen? And Jesus would say, I don't know. 
The Father knows. I do not. But when he comes back, he says, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. And what does he say? So go out and make disciples of all nations. And he ends it there. He does say, I will return sometime. He doesn't say soon. He doesn't give a date. He doesn't say next week. He just says, go out and make disciples. Because of Jesus' declaration that all authority rests with him, this meant that our access to God was no longer limited to a temple, a ritual, or a particular religious individual, such as a high priest who needed to sacrifice their own sins before bringing ours to God. We take it for granted that we can pray to God any time and in any place. We take it for granted that in asking God for forgiveness, our prayer is both heard and we are forgiven. But the preacher reminds us that this is only possible because of God's high priest who has given us constant access to God's love, not only to believers, but to all of humanity. Second, such continuous access means that not just our sins but our sinfulness, our sinful nature, is truly forgiven. And we can embrace assurance apart from what we do or whatever is done to us in this life. The prayers of the temple were only as effective as much as they bettered the lives of those who brought their sacrifices to the high priest. When the suffering of those individuals continued, in whatever form it continued, it meant only one thing. God had rejected the sacrifice, and they were not forgiven. That is why the preacher declares Unlike the other high priests, Jesus has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. This Jesus did once for all when he offered himself. Accordingly, Jesus has also become the guarantee of a better covenant. The guarantee that has been obtained for us by our one high priest leads to the third effect of Christ's sacrifice. Grace. Grace. Grace that we can obtain. A grace that is effective in the past, obtainable for the present, and protective for the future. In his book, The Humanity of God, Karl Barth explains how Christ's gift of grace frees us to approach God not in sacrificial fear, but in the joy and the gratitude of faith. This is what he writes. Jesus Christ is the mediator, the reconciler between God and humanity. Thus, Jesus comes forward to humanity on behalf of God, calling for and awakening faith, love, and hope, and comes forward to God on behalf of humanity, representing us, making satisfaction, and interceding. Thus, Christ attests to 
and guarantees to us God's free grace. And at the same time, attest and guarantees to God our free gratitude. No sacrifice involved, according to Bart. It's all free. Is the gratitude of which Bart speaks, our gratitude to our high priest, to Christ, this morning? Do any of you recall the eternal flame? How many of you have been to Washington and seeing the eternal flame at JFK's, oh, many, yes, of course, of course. We know about it. The eternal flame is a gas-supplied fire that burns at the grave of President John F. Kennedy and was lit originally during or at the conclusion of his funeral service. The flame was carefully built to continue burning under any and all conditions, including weather or human interference. Two weeks after the service, a group of Catholic school children visiting the gravesite poured holy water on the eternal flame and extinguished it. A nearby worker rushed over and relit the flame with a match. Since that day, the so-called eternal flame has been out many times for various reasons. Hard rain, gravesite renovation, and maintenance, just to, to name a few. It does go out. That little story reflects the truth that nothing of human origin be it religious or political or productive or social or historical, comes anywhere near the eternal. While it is true that we all have ancestors and we all have a human heritage, it really tells us nothing about who we really are or what we are beyond birth and life and death. But Hebrews tells us what is truly eternal. And in the eternity of our high priest, Jesus Christ, we see the only eternal flame, the true eternal flame, that can forever warm our hearts and light our lives with the love and the grace of God, our Father. That is an eternal flame that we, you and I, cannot light. But it is a flame that can be ignited in us if we embrace the love of Jesus and the faith and the gratitude and more wonderfully, the peace that comes with it. The eternal flame of Christ in our hearts is not about life and death. It's not even about heaven and hell. It is about call and fulfillment. Dietrich Bonhoeffer expressed that idea when he wrote these words just days before his martyrdom in Germany. There is no way to peace along the way of safety. For peace must be dared. It is itself the great venture and can never be safe. Peace is the opposite of security. You ever thought of that? Peace is the opposite of security. To demand guarantees is to want to protect oneself. Peace means giving oneself completely to God's commandment, not trying to direct it for selfish 
purposes. Battles are not won with weapons, but with God. They are won when the way leads to the cross. For you and I this morning, that is our way. The way of the cross. And it is a way lighted by the eternal flame of Christ's love. May it shine out of our hearts and out of our lives that it might light the world. Amen.